Hello everyone, welcome to Arc Talks Presents, a program brought to you by EPCC's Architecture Society. Today we'll be interviewing Ursula Kripa, Acting Director of the Architecture Program at Texas Tech University at El Paso, and Stephen Mueller, Director of Research and Assistant Professor at Texas Tech. They are the founders of Agency, a firm which has won many awards, such as the Rome Prize in Architecture, the One Prize, as well as the Emerging Voices Award. I'm your host, Stephanie Juarez, Treasurer of the Architecture Society. I hope you enjoy. I see you have your um, dog there. <laughs> yeah, we have an extra guest. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so what, uh, what would you like to talk about? Uh, well, first of all, I would like uh, if you want to introduce yourselves for our viewers who might not know who you are. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Ursula Kripa, and I'm the current acting director of the architecture program at the College of Architecture at Texas Tech University in El Paso. Um, and I also am the director of projects at, at the research center here at Texas Tech. And I also am partner at Agency, which is um, a, a private architecture practice that we run together. And I'm Stephen Mueller. Um, I also teach at Texas Tech University as a research assistant professor. Um, I'm the director of research at the research center um, post. Um, also an architect and founding partner at the agency. So together, we do a lot of things. <laughs> OK. Um, I was actually at one of your lectures once at, that came, when you came to IPCC um, in 2019. Yeah. So uh, I remember seeing your lecture. So it's great oh, to wow. see you again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, so I just wanted to ask a few questions. and. Um, I was looking through both of your Instagrams. I hope you don't mind. I wanted to get a little bit of information more about, about you both. <laughs> sure, of course. I um, wanted to ask a bit of questions about your interests that I saw. So one of the main ones that I noticed was um, the environment and how architecture can have an impact on that. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your take on that? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, climate change is real and it's, it's happening in our lifetimes. Um, and so I think the, the built environment um, is, uh, as we all know, accounts for something like upwards of 60% of all of the sort of the waste that is produced during construction and demolition. Uh, and so those are just really important numbers. Uh, buildings also use up to 70% of the world's energy and electricity and mechanical costs. And so it is really important that we as architects and designers um, are aware of how much the building industry impacts the environment. And therefore we need to really be a lot more responsible in, in how we design with the environment. Sustainable ways, right? Yeah, and I think more more broadly too, we're just interested in how how cities impact the environment and how the environment impacts our life in cities and public space. Um, and so you probably see not only in our in our practice and agency, we do a lot of work with environmental sensing, trying to trying to find out um, areas of cities that might be sort of underrepresented, but maybe overexposed to different environmental threats. We've done some projects, <laughs> we've done some projects with um, placing air quality monitoring sensors in um, on both sides of the border here in El Paso and in Ciudad Juarez in order to figure out um, sort of how the air quality differential in different neighborhoods um, might be mapped and measured and, and might be made available to the communities that are impacted by, by poor air quality that, that impacts health and uh, any number of things. Um, and I think we're, we're continuing that work uh, in maybe other trajectories in the, the research center here and also in the studios that we teach um, the, the students that are here at Texas Tech. Right. Thank you. Um, so what, what, impact you think architects can have on, on politics and making a difference? Right, so um, yes, I think that's a really good question. Um, and this came up as, as part of our conversation from, from our social media feeds. Um, so if you're seeing this on the screen, um, we, we feel that it is very important for architects and designers 
um, to be politically engaged and to understand how their work might uh, have an impact. So whether or not the impact is positive or negative, um, we think architects should always be involved in designing for equity, um, equitable spaces, and accessible spaces for everyone. Uh, we don't believe that architects should just respond to um, only very wealthy clients' needs. I think we should find ways that anything we build in cities or in urban environments impacts and, and uh, provides services to everyone, even, even to people who cannot afford it. So here's uh, one example. This part of some of the work we do is in addition to designing, building, teaching, and researching, we also um, write really short essays for the architect's newspaper. Um, and the idea for these essays is to also describe the political context where we practice. Um, this was a, a, a short essay we wrote um, two summers ago when the private border wall was being built um, right here in um, on the border between um, El Paso and or Texas and New Mexico, uh, but also on, on the border, right? This is this was the Steve Bannon wall that was built privately um, at the brick factory on the Rio Grande, right by the American Dam. Um, we drive by it every day to to go to school to teach, um, and we were just really appalled that that this uh, enormous private border wall went up without any kind of environmental uh, reviews. Uh, it had a huge negative impact on the, the fragile ecology of, the, of Cristo Rey. Uh, they had to fill an arroyo with something like 60 feet of soil. So they destroyed that, that tiny, you know, sort of the microscopic ecology that exists in the desert here. Um, but also this model, we, we made these drawings um, and we actually digitally modeled in Rhino um, these, these tools that they use to build uh, the wall. Um, the construction company hybridized construction tools and construction machinery so that they could build a wall faster and better. So these machines actually have a hybrid arm that picks up parts of the wall and kind of um, sticks them in the ground. So the wall is both foundation and wall at the same time. And so in, we close our essay by, by calling on all designers and contractors to boycott and to not use these types of technologies because uh, we believe these technologies are designed with this kind of um, really violent, exclusionary, racist agenda in mind. Um, and we should not be engaging in, in that kind of work. Okay. And another thing I wanted to ask is, uh, with all the different events and things that happened in this past year, um, do you think any of these events are going to have an impact on the way we, we perceive architecture, the way we architects um, work in the future? Do you mean, do you mean the political events that have been happening? Um, the pandemic? Well, yeah, pandemic, political events, and all of the right. crazy yeah. things that happened this past year. Yeah, we can maybe talk about both, both of those things because we've, we've done work kind of related to, to um, both of those fronts. Um, so with the political events, you know, I think we've been interested in a long time, uh, for a long time, about how cities have been kind of progressively uh, sliding towards, go to the book? Um, yeah. Progressively sliding towards being more and more um, uh, focused on issues of security and even um, kind of police response and militarization. So, um, can we share this? Yes. So we have a <coughs> we have a book that we just co-authored um, called Fronts: Military Urbanisms in the Developing World, where we kind of map these trajectories. Um, you know, and this this has impact on uh, how police forces respond to protests and how they exploit different kinds of buildings and different kinds of urban situations in order to kind of uh, stifle dissent basically and, and kind of relegate protests to different areas of the city um, and it also has to do with how, um, how the military trains um, in order to basically conduct what they call urban operations so how, how um, if there is an urban conflict somewhere else in the world um, how they are deployed and how they manage um, populations by, by kind of exploiting buildings and, and infrastructures and kind of urban situations. So the book um, in, in 
really, really briefly, the, uh, over the last several decades, the military has been building these kind of brick and mortar simulated cities um, all over the world on military bases mostly in order to train military forces and police forces to do these sorts of things, to basically, you know, be expert at, at using buildings and cities um, to counter uh, counterinsurgency and counter protests and, and things like this. Um, and so what we've done is uh, this process that we call sort of counter mapping. Um, basically there's not a map really readily available of where all of these sites are and what they look like and how they're used and how they're trained for. And so we, we dug into kind of um, uh, military and police documents and government documents in order to find these sites and really write um, what we consider to be kind of the architectural and urban history of these sites, these kind of simulated sites. So here you see from our database, um, we were able to geolocate all of these sites so we can find them on Google Earth. Um, and we can start to really look carefully at the types of buildings that are replicated on these sites. And we, we analyze then how these, these kinds of buildings and these kinds of urban spaces, in this case, you see the mosque, right? Um, end up being kind of targeted or criminalized as, as kind of sites that are suspected of, um, you know, of kind of nefarious activities, um, really to the detriment of, you know, huge numbers of our population. You know, this is basically criminalizing, um, you know, Islamic worship, right. <laughs> or, or at least suspecting spaces of Islamic worship. And, and then training yourself to be able to, to sort of dominate uh, with lethal force in those spaces. And so um, that, that's one trajectory. I think we're, we're interested in understanding that trajectory, but then also understanding the kind of like counter trajectory, right? Like how do we, um, how do we instead make cities more democratic and more open um, and, and to, you know, to argument, let's say, to protest the different views, the diversity, right? Like, how do we not um, make that kind of a scary thing um, that we have to put money and weapons up against? And how do we how do we actually make that um, something that we value again and that we build into our public spaces? And then for uh, and then you know, 2020 was dominated by the pandemic discussion, um, and uh, in that way, or towards that front, we were one of the very early teams um, as part of a much larger collect collective of colleagues who were teaching in architecture universities all over the nation to uh, 3D print PPE. So part of our, uh, what, when people were first terrified of PPE <laughs> and they were hiding you know, at home away, we actually came to school School was shut down for those two weeks until Texas Tech um, was figuring out online classes. And so um, we were using our 3D printing machines, both our two personal ones and, and the machines that the school has um, to make these face, uh, face shield visors. We made masks. Um, this was another one of the kind of the respirators um, and Part of our what we felt as designers was that if we have a skill set and we have the 3D printers just sitting there, uh, why not help our community? So we distributed 500 um, face shields to TTU Health Science Clinics, and then about 500 to um, other hospitals and also to Navajo Nation, um, the, the Native uh, American population, which is really suffering um, from the pandemic due to lack of water and um, and medical, medical resources. And so we spent from March till June or July, um, really around the clock, uh, teaching full-time and making uh, the, the 3D printing PPE full-time and driving it ourselves and distributing it. So even though this was not directly related to architecture, it's directly related to design and to skill sets that architects have. Um, these are digital files that were shared online and and we were modifying them in Rhino ourselves and, and figuring out what our machines could do. So in a way it was a design exercise as well. Um, and we're, we're very proud of this work. Okay, well, um, I do notice that you have a, uh, you're very active on, on Instagram and I don't know about other pl platforms, but do you think that's a valuable tool that architects can use as you're using social media to, to their advantage? Absolutely, I think, um, I think we've really benefited from uh, social media um, 
by connecting with colleagues who may be doing similar work, but they live across the globe, right? So there are people who are doing similar work in Hong Kong or you know in London that we would not necessarily meet, right? If we were if we didn't have social media, how would we know? And so um, by posting, so we have our own social media channels, and then we have the ones for the College of Architecture for our students' work. Um, that's the TTU El Paso uh, Instagram feed. And so what we've noticed is that people have noticed our work and then they'll, they'll invite us to conferences or exhibitions or to give lectures. And so we've really been able to broadcast and, and really expand the reach of our work through social media. Um, and so I think that's a very well curated uh, social media presence is really important in the, in the design community. You probably saw this project. I think Stephen's going to share it. You saw the selfie wall um, when we presented it, and this was one way to take to take the idea of social media and selfie sharing and to make that a physical design problem. Um, and so this was kind of the, the flattering selfie wall out in public space for, for Chalk the Block here in El Paso. And we also turned it into a design fabrication problem. You know, how do you CNC mill? Uh, out of like a flat aluminum panel in order to create this kind of volumetric space. People were doing yoga um, uh, around it. They called it selfie yoga because it was by the selfie wall. Um, but, but yeah, I think our, our social media both translates to how we, what we design, what we're concerned with, but also how we present ourselves to the world. Yeah, it's, it's and especially now, like social media is maybe one of the, the best public forums, right? It is the public space, <laughs> at least this year, you know, it's, it's one of the only places that we can kind of be together. And I think it's really important for architects and for everybody to just share ideas um, in public and, and be able to have those kinds of spaces. And so like the selfie wall is a little tongue in cheek, but it's, um, you know, trying to merge a kind of historic notion of like making a space and making a place to engage with these kind of digital realms that, that we're also kind of equally inhabiting, right? And I think that'll be a huge question, you know, moving forward for, uh, in terms of the pandemic, but also in terms of architecture in general, like how do we, how do we take our digital selves, our virtual selves, our social media selves, and our physical urban selves, right? And like find spaces where um, all of those things can, can kind of happen. And kind of moving off the topic, um, something I was wanting to ask is, um, I don't know if you've heard of the term imposter syndrome, but um, well, something that I experienced as a student in architecture is kind of feeling like maybe you don't fit in. So was there ever, ever a time as an architecture student or when you're um, actually working as an architect that you felt maybe that you were suffering from imposter syndrome? Absolutely. It's, it's very real and it still happens. <laughs> yeah. Today so, or yeah, yeah. How <laughs> all the time. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I grew up in, in, in poverty, in communist dictatorship in Albania. And, you know, I was, I was a refugee and then an immigrant in Greece from my country when I was in my teenage years. So, so when I ended up uh, studying my, for my master's at Columbia University of New York, I remember every single day I'd show up to class and just think, I, d I don't know how I got here, but I, I belong. You know, like how, how can like a poor little girl from Albania, you know, Eastern Europe be here? Um, and then we've been so lucky throughout our careers to win um, really amazing awards and fellowships and one of them was to live and study to do our research in Rome for a year um, and I remember the moment the, the cab the taxi dropped us off at the front gates of this incredible villa in Italy in, in Rome we, we just could not we thought there was a mistake like that maybe they, they accepted us by mistake or something <laughs> And even now, like I feel incredibly lucky to be able to direct this program here, to work with our amazing students, um, all of you guys, right, from EPCC who come to us. Just an incredible, like, talented pool of students who really take their work seriously. So even just on a day-to-day -day basis, it feels like um, this is we're so lucky, and this is kind of too much, you know. Um, so yeah, so I ha that that never that never ends if you're. If you're humble and aware of, of where you are, you know. 
I think another dimension to that is um, that the that the work that we choose to do. I think it's come up a couple of times in conversation. You know that we're saying, you know, this isn't quite architecture, but it's using architectural skills. You know, in order to do this or that. Oftentimes, we find ourselves in front of an architectural audience. You know, explaining these kind of quasi architectural <laughs> elements to our work, right? And um, and we're 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 always uh, sort of approaching the work from you know from our passions and our interests and then finding audiences for it and there's not always you know a one to one relationship like people show up to lectures expecting to see you know construction documents of our, of our latest project or something we're talking about patents for border border wall construction or something like this instead and um, you know i think that's also important that it's not just um, kind of from your individual perspective trying to find you know, comfort in maybe, you know, uh, the, the discipline itself, but also like from whatever your interests are and your abilities that you're gaining from, from the discipline, being comfortable enough to, to kind of like chart your own path and, and really define for yourself what, what is valuable architectural work, right? Um, because I think everybody has their own, their own answer to that. Um, but yeah, you always, it, <laughs> It's it, it's always uh, I think an, an issue, um, you know. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Um, I think our our time is coming to a close. Anything else you wanted to mention? Um, I think for for students who are listening, um, I was just looking at our background that we're always surrounded by books. I would say just. Um, read right surround yourself surround yourself with books with thinkers with other designers with as much information as you can possibly take in um, because as an educator um, that that would be my my main advice that learning never stops i'm still learning and we're going to learn until the day we die um, and so i think uh, just continuing to learn and read and surrounding yourself by good information that would be my advice for the students anyway that's great advice. <laughs> yeah, and I think we just look forward to hearing from you all, like one of our favorite moments of the year, at, at least back when we could do it in physical space, was when EPCC students would show up at, at Texas Tech College of Architecture El Paso to get kind of the tour and to imagine yourselves here. Um, you know, just feel free to reach out. You know, I think those kinds of things are probably virtual. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, uh, reach out to us or to folks that you know here, and, and you know, we'd love to we'd love to see you. All right, thank you very much. Um, it was great talking to you. I learned a lot from our conversation, and yeah, well, thank you very much. Yeah, it was very nice to meet you. It was nice to meet you too. This concludes our program. Thank you for listening to Art Talks Presents, brought to you by EPCC's Architecture Society, an interview with Ursula Kripa and Steven Mueller. This is your host, Stephanie Juarez. Until next time.